and welcome to the second episode of our new Frequently Asked Questions series on immersion cooling solutions. As before, we've been consolidating questions we get regularly from events and online inquiries, and we're eager to get those answers out there once again. This episode focuses specifically on the Asperitas product and what it does, so I hope you enjoy learning all about it. Let me firstly introduce the speakers for today, Michael Bricius, Business Development Manager, and Andy Young, CTO, both at Asperitas. Thanks for joining, guys. Thanks, Amelia. You're welcome. Okay, so let's begin with the first question. There is a lot of talk about liquid cooling for data centers. Could you quickly introduce Asperitas and where the liquid in the liquid cooling space we are? Yeah, sure, shall I kick that one off and then uh, probably we'll touch yeah. upon uh, quite a bit of it later in uh, in this session as well. But just a quick introduction, uh, within liquid cooling, uh, there's a variety of uh, of solution categories. Um, and I'll leave leave it there for, for this question now, actually, that there's, um, you have direct water cooled, uh, which you see here on the bottom, uh, where we bring liquid to the components directly attached. Um, and then there's immersion cooling in two main categories, a single phase immersion cooling and dual phase immersion cooling. Um, and to keep it really simple, Asperitas is offering a solution in the single phase immersion cooling. And I think uh, later on, uh, Emilia Andy will explain a bit more in detail of what it entails and how we do that, right? Nice. Okay, on to the next question. Could you explain the main differences between Asperitas and other liquid cooling technologies? Uh, Andy, if you could step in for this one. Yeah, sure, no problem. Well, um, liquid cooling involves a range of different approaches, as you've seen, um, but each of them have one thing in common. They capture the heat to water, ultimately. Um, how it gets into the water um, and how much of it gets into the air uh, around the server or the rack is, is one key difference. Um, and also the energy it takes to drive the water in, uh, the heat into the water is another. So heat capture proportions to water and the energy cost of achieving that process. At Asperitas, uh, we use full immersion, natural conversion cooling, which means 97% of the heat is captured to the water, only 3% going to the air side, minimizing the, the uh, chiller power requirements. And because uh, it's natural convection, uh, there's no energy penalty to achieve this. So uh, more of the energy available is uh, utilized by the IT equipment for its production workload. And uh, the IT is cooled uh, well enough uh, for it to do its work effectively. Um, so efficiency um, is key. And of course, with immersion cooling, as long as gravity is on, which will happen for a very long time, um, you know, a power outage or a failure of the pump or fan isn't an issue in this case. So we can cool up to one and a half kilowatts per U uh, without having to resort to phase change or pumps, which means we can maintain great serviceability and GWP performance. Nice. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, actually, uh, could we talk a little bit more about the immersed computing concept and particularly how it's actually different to um, uh, other immersion cooling concepts? Michael, perhaps you could take this one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, immersed computing is uh, is a unique Asperitas concept. Um, and it not only entails the way we, we cool, and again, Andy will probably dive into that a little bit more uh, later, but also in the way we work, right? So in general, it's our whole approach towards uh, immersion cooling. Um, we strongly believe in solutions where the entire system is optimized for immersion cooling. Um, and therefore we work closely together with different kind of partners to do so as well, um, including server OEM partners, but also we have developed an immersion cooling fluid product with Shell for this purpose. Um, and then there's this technical aspect, um, part of the concept, which has to do with how we transfer heat away from the components, uh, as men Andy mentioned, by natural convection. And uh, I believe, uh, Andy, there's a little bit more we can talk about it now. Sure. Yeah, so the animation is really nice. Uh, I think it really helps to visualize what's going on um, inside the module. So we have two main loops, both in parallel. It's the same left and right hand side. Thanks, Amelia, for clicking the play button. Um, yeah, so you can see how the heat um, is causing convection 
due to uh, volume expansion of the coolant. It's been designed to, to have great properties for volume expansion. Um, and that, that energy boost uh, that it gets uh, drives a recirculation flow. We also have a similar boost coming from the uh, temperature reduction as the, flow, as the fluid gets heavier, it, 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 it travels downwards. And you can see that on the, on the, the, the outer sides where the heat exchangers are. So this, this racetrack that the fluid is going around is energized uh, twice, once by the heating, once by the cooling. Um, and it, so that really gives you more than just what you normally get from natural convection because it approaches the heat sources already with a drive behind it. Uh, it's really great. Um, of course, uh, gravity is on all the time, thankfully, otherwise um, things will be very different. Um, and that means that the cooling, uh, the cooling is always on as long as there is heat source and gravity. Um, so the reduction in the Fairley domain is achieved in this way. Uh, keeping things as simple as we can. The, uh, the last thing that you want indeed is a failed pump at the bottom of a tank to have to remove and service. Um, the system is also self-regulating. So where the heat is, is where the motivation to flow is. Um, so rather than having to place a pump or, or cold plate on each of the heat sources, the fact that there is heat there really gathers the flow to that location. And for that reason, we can have quite densely populated um, servers, and you'll see a few examples later on to show the density that we can achieve. Nice, that's really interesting, actually. Um, we should just move on to the next question. Um, Asperitas offers a range of solutions. Could you introduce them, Michael? Yeah, sure. And uh, of course, this is, a, an, I think, a natural follow-up of the previous questions. Um, let's start with yeah, basically the two product categories we have in our portfolio where the first one is most important. Those are the immersion cooling systems we offer. Um, to support immersion cooling, we also offer um, surface tooling. Um, and again, we'll, we'll explain a little bit more about it later on, but let's focus for now on the, on the core products in our portfolio, the immersion cooling systems. Uh, as you can see here, there are two main uh, products, um, whereas the, the original system, which is actually uh, here presented on the left side, is slightly smaller than the right and larger system. Um, um, they have the same capabilities and features, actually, um, and they're based on the same product design. Um, so they're different in physical uh, size, and therefore the server size it also can facilitate within. Um, so both solutions are a great fit for different use cases um, where the smaller system is offering a high density uh, capability um, and that where the larger system allows for more flexibility regarding hardware integration, right? Nice. What about you, Andy? Could you maybe explain a bit more on the features, product design? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so we work within the OCP guidelines for motion of cooling. And as uh, Michael explained, there's a 15 inch and a 21 inch uh, ready version. So 15 inch, typically you would align with uh, two half width server boards, seven inch server boards with a bit of room. And 21 inches obviously for, for three of, of the same. But of course, that's just the space that we have to work in in the OCP cassette designs. You can really have a lot of uh, different uh, IT configurations um, within this uh, platform. So two sizes. Um, we can we call the main uh, unit um, a module, so that dark uh, grey uh, region is is the module that contains both the IT and the heat exchangers and everything else that's in the immersion zone, including switches. Um, and the servers um, are placed in what we call cassettes, so they're sort of top loaded um, uh, from above when the lids open. And uh, the IT is in this sort of metal, metal cassette um, enclosure. They can be one U or two U, or in fact any any number of U. Uh, we support uh, the standard U and the OU as well, and we have great flexibility. You can mix and match different U heights, different locations, uh, according to how you want to configure your IT. But sort of, and in each case, we can have twenty four U in total per module. So there's there's great uh, uh, range of possibilities there. In the center between the uh, two banks of the cassettes, as you can see, there's a space. So in, in you know in the middle, and this is where we have two management switches, 
also in the immersed zone to minimize the side losses and to give uh, great cable management locally to the compute cassettes, um, which really works well. And you can see that in some of the other pictures, those uh, central connection cables and the interfaces really do have short runs and is uh, quite straightforward for maintenance. Um, yeah, so that, that gives us lots of benefit, not in, only in terms of uh, flexibility, uh, but also maintainability as well. Yeah, maybe this is also a good moment again, uh, just to make that really clear. We did mention earlier on that uh, the heat exchanges or convection drives, as we also call them, are integrated within the solutions, right? Uh, to drive this natural convection flow as we, uh, um, yeah, as is part of the immersed computing concepts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. thanks for that explanation. Let's move on to the next question. As you mentioned, the service tooling portfolio, um, without going into it too much, could you tell us what that entails? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, without going in, into the real portfolio of, of the different solutions, but um, yeah, you see now one here actually on, on screen in, in action, actually, it's uh, probably the most important element if it comes to that. But let me first start with mentioning that immersion cooling is also another way of working and that starts with being prepared, right? Um, so in our projects uh, throughout the whole delivery process, um, and later on we'll talk about this, uh, the roadmap we work on usually with first time users, and we will prepare the users uh, for the technology and also make them aware of the operational changes and the tooling required. And one crucial step uh, in that case is also training of the team. As you can see here, one of our colleagues actually uh, in action, right? And we'll train the team of, of our user and customer um, to do this job, right? To, uh, to, to, t uh, yeah, to learn them how to use the surf trolley and maintain a clean environment in a data center as, as they are used to today, right? Um, so nothing, nothing will change about standards in terms of cleanliness or uh, operational aspects. Um, but it's another way of working, and we offer the tooling and um, and, the, and the training to support that new approach, right? I see. Uh, thanks for that clarification. In the previous episode, we spoke about shell and the immersion cooling fluid. For those who missed that episode, could you introduce that for me? Andy. Certainly. Um, so the fluid specifically um, uh, that we use um, has been developed for this purpose. Um, it's an engineered fluid. It's um, used in our lab, of course, uh, during our product development um, and also for OEM testing. And we work together with the Shell R&D team um, in its um, further optimization and also to um, investigate and to uh, validate its suitability for a range of, uh, the full range of different IT equipment that we have. As you can imagine, there's, there's a whole host of different material types and, uh, and the, the environments in which that material is, is put whilst it's cooled, it is um, in elevated temperature and there's, there's um, a, it needs to work and exist in there for a long time. Um, so the liquid um, properties are very closely controlled. Uh, properties such as its dielectric constant essential for it to work as an immersion zone for electronics equipment. Uh, its fire rating of, of course is, is really important so that we can uphold the um, safety um, requirements of the data center and of course and uh, for me as a thermodynamics guy the the heat transfer properties too um, are all optimized and balanced and ensured that there is the best uh, performance in each of these these key areas of dielectric fire rating and heat transfer um, one of the great uh, outcomes of working with shell in the development of the coolant is we can co-optimize, co-optimize the coolant and the heat sink designs and the heat exchanger that Michael mentioned, uh, the fluid drives to work and get the best performance out of the uh, dielectric coolant. Um, so by understanding well the properties of the coolant, how that varies itself with, with temperature um, and understanding how its properties, both mechanical and electrical, can be used um, to give the best performance 
working closely with, with Shell and their experts, it really gives us a, a benefit in the market. So where you can take a standard heatsink designed for air, we know how to adapt that to give the best performance in immersion cooling and for the particular coolant that we use. So together, all of its property, all of the benefits, the way in which you can, it's got great thermal performance, dielectric performance and fire rating, um, plus the way that we can co-optimize really gives us uh, the ability to cool right across the the range of um, types of equipment. And if we do have any concerns or risks, then we can work uh, closely with Shell to do materials compatibility assessment at a very um, scientific level to really give great confidence in the product. And I know we have a little bit more time. Maybe this is also uh, still an opportunity, Andy, to explain a little bit the difference between the single phase immersion cooling and the dual phase. We mentioned it briefly in the beginning of the session, of course, but maybe, I mean, it's all about the coolant. Maybe it's an opportunity yeah, sure. to explain it a bit more, yeah? Well, yeah, I mean, so um, single phase is really where the liquid uh, remains um, a liquid. Um, so it it's, um, moves around. Um, but it doesn't change phase. It doesn't uh, turn into a gas. Of course, gases are far lower density and they expand. Um, you know, when a liquid becomes a gas, just, just like in your car or a steam engine, uh, the, when the, the phase change happens, it's, its volume expands and it becomes very um, low densities. So the amount of uh, flow and, and and uh, transfer of mass and heat is, uh, is, insist is um, assisted. However, when it expands, of course, you don't want to create uh, an engine where things, you know, the container starts moving. So you, it in, you know, the, uh, there are ventilation issues you, and you have to manage and therefore condense that gas back into a fluid again. So that's how the process works. For single phase, it's just a fluid, simple. Yeah. And straightforward for two phase you get some benefits uh but you have to condense and manage manage the um, containment and the volume of coolant that's um, working for you for two phase of course uh, you're exploiting one of the natural um, forces of heat transfer um, so the amount of heat you can move per surface uh, for, for for two phases is is enhanced um, however you can't extend the surfaces in the same way as you would do for a conventional heat sink so you you uh, there are some limitations around the amount of surface area you can use for heat transfer but per unit surface area the the performance so it's a bit of a, a balancing act between which of the yeah. two solutions you would go forwards with in the thermal design and uh, we feel that that uh, single phase and two phase are really both great options depending on what the requirements are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was good to get that further explanation actually on single phase and two phase. So that's good. Um, but on to the next one. This is a good one. Um, could you actually talk us through the capacity, specs, and requirement of the facility? Sure, um, Michael. Uh, shall I take this one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, that's great. So, yeah. So, when we have the modules as shown in this image here placed in the facility, of course, there's a lot of um, um, details uh, that we need to work through with you. Um, so the, uh, but really we have a great process for that. So we have guidelines uh, written ready for the 15 and the 21 inch modules um, explaining the, the interfaces. So where the connections are made, what the specifications for those connections are. Um, and we also, to make it easy and straightforward, we align with the ASHRAE standards for water chemistry. Uh, so the, any filtration, any, any biocides necessary, and uh, the uh, water glycol content and so on it is all laid out already by ASHRAE and we, we uh, fully align and follow those uh, standards to make it as straightforward as, as, as we can. Also with ASHRAE, they've uh, developed standards for the water flow temperature. And uh, we, uh, that goes on, the, on what they call the W scale 
from W, I think it's one or maybe two up to five. Um, the higher the number you go, the, the uh, higher the flow temperature can be and the less uh, dependence you have on um, air side chillers or chillers indeed for the water. So uh, W4 and W5 are our go-to uh, positions on the scale for ASHRAE, which means uh, free air cooling is very much uh, par for the course for our products. And also W5 for heat recovery. So the return temperature, I think in, in previous uh, talks and articles from Asperitas, you'll have seen mention of return temperatures up to 55 degrees and, and higher, which means we, while we recover the heat to water, you've got a great quality in that heat to go and do something useful with. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the guidelines uh, are clarified um, and, uh, and well documented. And we, we have a team of uh, field engineers, which um, know them very well and uh, really work every step of the way with you on that. Um, also, uh, in addition to the cooling interfaces, we also have, and this is really key, is the uh, fully support redundancy for power and cooling. So you already have mention of the, the two heat exchangers. So everything in the system is, um, is uh, uh, redundant, with the exception of one thing, which is the PLC. But the PLC really is an industry standard unit full, uh, fully configured, which has the safety and control measures built in uh, the controls you know monitors and controls the temperature flow rate of the cooling environments and the water and uh, makes sure that you're getting great energy performance but also uh, great safety control as well that's all um, accessed through a um, a portal um, and a dashboard so you can monitor and control uh, the PLC and therefore the module, and the module itself is DCIM ready, supporting protocols including Modbus and OPC UA as well. So uh, we feel in that way it it's, um, gives great um, control now and also is able to integrate with DCIM systems should your facilities use that. Yeah, I think it's also worthwhile mentioning um, the solution gives uh, yeah a lot of flexibility in terms of what kind of data centers it can be uh, deployed. As you can see on the visual here, actually uh, all kinds of data centers uh, um, have been deployed with our immersion cooling uh, systems, from containerized to um, brownfield locations, um, mixed environments, but also optimized environments uh, within a data center. It's usually a question like uh, the assumption is made that there are limitations of where immersion cooling can be placed. It's actually the other way around, I would say. Immersion cooling can standardize efficiency across the board in many kinds of locations and many kinds of data centers. Um, so I think that's also good to share here. Thank you. It's, it's good to hear how flexible um, the facility can really be. Um, that's very interesting indeed. Um, on to the next question. Um, just a quick note, we're going to talk next time about how Asperitas works with OEMs and integration partners from server certification to integrated solutions. A question that often comes up is what kind of hardware can be facilitated? Yeah, yeah, indeed, it comes up, uh, of course, uh, quite often because in our process, usually we start with the requirements if it comes to IT, right? So that that's the main purpose of immersion, immersion cooling uh, to cool the IT uh, hardware. Um, and actually, quite exciting, Emilia. To uh, next session, uh, I, I guess uh, we'll talk about this much more. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, things we can share about this. Um, but indeed, um, well, what you see here. Um, Let's start first. We, we work very close together with different uh, OEM, uh, server OEM partners, but also on the semiconductor side um, and also integrators. Um, but what you see here is, um, is the very simple and straightforward uh, three-step certification process, um, which is a proven process by now. Um, any of our projects have been through this process. Um, and this is all to ensure service solutions work reliable, predictable, and, and in an optimal way in immersion, right? This is something I think we can spend a lot of time on. I think we won't do that now, um, but uh, altogether, um, yeah, customers and first time users, um, yeah, they, they won't notice too much about this process. We mostly do this for integrators and, and the OEMs we work with um, to make it, yeah, make life easy actually for our users, right? 
Um, so we do the same actually uh, on next generation server developments. Um, and uh, you see here some of the names. Uh, one worth while mentioning, I think, is, is NVIDIA. We have a very close partnership and collaboration with them. Um, but also integrators like uh, Boston and, and Penguin Computing um, offering integrated solutions with uh, state-of-the-art um, hardware components. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think we can show some examples, Andy, actually. So. Yeah, um, I'd love to, to talk about uh, some of the examples. So I think here you can see two examples. This is a 21-inch uh, cassette. On the left, we have a CPU-based solution. On the right is a combination of CPU and GPU. So, um, and this also illustrates how uh, we support the OCP uh, cassette design. Um, so, um, yeah, so on the left, you, uh, you can see the great density, which we can work to. Uh, so we really have got a lot of uh, IT equipment in there, those, those three, uh, three uh, seven inch um, uh, servers. The, 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 the power supply is, is placed at the bottom to align with the interfaces on the server boards. Uh, power distribution board also immersed alongside. And then the SSD uh, uh, bays you, uh, you can see fully populated. Um, and then and, uh, so we promote the power and the drives down to the bottom. Uh, mainly because of the interfaces. Um, and then next up is the uh, CPUs. So uh, you can see here in this case, we've used the standard OEM uh, heat sinks. Um, we, we didn't have to uh, modify them, optimize them. We, we were able to get uh, sufficient performance out of the standard part, meaning that more of the equipment which you already get from the OEM can be applied it, uh, directly in the immersion cooled environment. And uh, then at the top, you can see there's expansion cards, which we can also cool uh, very well. Uh, they're in the immersion zone. And then just above the expansion cards is where we go from the liquid to the air domain. When we're into the air domain, of course, you have interface cables, uh, which, which are, are half in and half out of the liquid. And then right at the top, on the top edge of the server is where the interface is to, uh, for power and uh, IO are. Are positioned. So really on the left, it's, it's, it's great to see that density and you, you can see how the, all that um, is cooled by immersion um, and without need for any, any fans. On the right hand side, it's, it's a similar, well, it's the same containment, it's the same, um, it's the same cassette, literally, but the way in which uh, the equipment that we position in it and how we configure that is different. So in this case, you've got um, GPUs, so four GPUs at the bottom, again promoted to the bottom of the cassettes uh, due to their having a higher power and a more stringent temperature requirement than the CPUs. But we can still cool GPUs and, and CPUs in the same in the same cassette environment. Um, you, you can also see if you look very carefully at the kind of a, a third of the way up, there's SSDs there too, and um, they are. Um, uh, place it as you can uh, see with short interfaces to the uh, main boards. So yeah, um, and then plenty of room to spare at the top. Um, and so uh, opportunity to add more storage or more expansion above the uh, CPUs in the case on the right. Um, so yes, so two different examples, um, but two great examples of how we can work within the OCP standards and uh, support um, expansion and uh, SSDs and different power configurations and give interfaces to the, for power and for IO as well. Excellent. Um, that actually brings us nicely onto the next question. Um, it's just a quick side step actually is, Asperitas has been an OCP member since 2017 and active as an immersion cooling leader. So the platinum, the platinum membership has just been extended too. The work we've talked about today, how does that fit in with OCP? Andy. Shall I take that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our, our role in, IC, in OCP has, has been uh, there since 2017. And uh, we have um, made a number of contributions um, over that course of time and still now. 
Um, so we have um, a, a lead role in the, the immersion cooling um, uh, chapter and also uh, contributors as well. So make technical contributions to a number of different areas in, uh, within that. We also, alongside uh, Shell, have contributions to the materials compatibility area in OCP as well, which really works well. And we feel that we contribute strongly, but also learn a lot and, and share a lot of our knowledge openly, which is uh, to everybody's benefit. Um, of course, um, having OCP there as well gives us a great context to work within, and you can see how we use it. So on the right-hand side, those uh, examples of the OCP cassettes is really exactly what we did in those two examples that we showed you a few slides ago, left-hand side being the CPU version, right-hand side being the CPU-GPU combination. And um, yeah, so it's, it, it, it really helps us to... to um, understand what the requirements are of the end users for immersion cooling, but also you, you can see here how it enables us to share our experience and uh, be good uh, partners within the community for immersion cooling. Indeed, thanks for that Andy. We're going to be wrapping up soon, but before that, for organisations interested in immersion cooling, how should they actually get started? Michael, how about you take this one? Yeah, sure. I believe this is actually the, the last question, Emilia, right? So I yeah. think we, we, I mean, we answered uh, uh, quite uh, the frequent asked questions we, we get if it comes to the solution, right? But uh, I also feel it's just questioning the surface. Um, so yeah, indeed, how do you start with immersion cooling? Um, well, immersion cooling can have a tremendous impact on, on the performance and sustainability, um, the design and operations, but also the business case for data centers. Um, but what it can do for a specific organization depends on different variables, right? Um, also, our experience is that with working um, with large enterprises and, and telco organizations, uh, for example, um, uh, if you're a first-time user, then within the organization, you will need to um, get the knowledge and experience to, to be developed to truly discover the value of immersion cooling. Um, and what we offer here is a roadmap approach to support that experience, right? Um, because immersion cooling can yeah, optimize the data center efficiency, but it can also innovate your model of operation uh, when we do this well. Um, and we strongly believe in, the, in this roadmap approach going from a knowledge exchange, um, which also includes trainings and uh, design support, um, but also analysis of the requirements in, in detail and the ambitions you might have as an organization. I'm going to piloting and also scale out uh, planning uh, up to large scale projects. And so we have the team and also um, we like to bring in our partners to support a roadmap uh, approach like this. Um, and that will support yeah, you as a user and especially first time users to become um, yeah, future ready and develop a strategy uh, for immersion cooling that, that will enable that, right? Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to go through the whole process, uh, especially in once, but maybe you want to step in later in this process because you already have some experience or different requirements or, or interest. Um, so this is a flexible uh, roadmap approach, but we can take you from zero to 10, I would say, if it comes to uh, the experience to, to immersion cooling, right? Nice. Thanks for that. And thank you for tuning in, tuning in, actually, and for participating in this second Frequently Asked Questions episode. I look forward to the next one. And also thanks to the listeners and viewers. If anyone does have any more questions, please refer to the Aspevathus website, which you can see here. You can also request an online demonstration to discuss the integrated technology in more depth. Lastly, you can connect with all speakers on LinkedIn, if you wish. And that's all from us for now. Thanks again to you, Michael and Andy, and see you at the next episode. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Amelia. Very good. Thanks, everybody. All the best. Thanks.